Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. You can come to order, please. This is the July 20th, 2020, 7 p.m. meeting of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners. I'm Chair Amy Scott Gailey. With us tonight on the phone is Vice Chair Steve Carter. Vice Chair Carter, can you hear me? I can. Great. And we also have um, Commissioner Bill Lashley, Commissioner Eddie Boswell, and Commissioner Tim Sutton. So, Commissioner Sutton, would you please lead us in an invocation in the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes, I will. Uh, occasionally, I'll do something a little unconventional, which doesn't surprise too many people, I'm sure, but uh, I wanted to play tonight a, uh, a video uh, by Ray Charles doing America the Beautiful at a uh, World Series game back in 2001, and I understand we can't do that, and but he did many versions of that, and I don't watch them that I don't tear up and uh, the spirit is there of what our country is all about, good or bad, good and bad, but the spirit is there of America. And I thought, well, okay, I can't show the video, so I'll at least talk a little bit about what I've got on my mind and on my heart. Um, our country is going through some unbelievable scenarios, things that I thought I'd never see socially and medically and so forth so on politically and I know our country stands for freedom it stands for democracy uh, a system of government where people do vote the majority wins and so forth and so on but uh, as I told somebody today it hurts me to think that our children if we don't solve the problems of this nation within a reasonable manner uh, if we don't do it for ourselves, the adults, we need to do it for the children. I have a granddaughter. I have a grandson. I, have, I was speaking to a county employee that has a beautiful son. And I said, for, at least for them and everybody like them, we've got to do more than we're doing somehow, some way, to get things to be as America should be. And I thought that song by Ray Charles uh, hit many notes. People in that crowd were crying. They were wiping their eyes. Uh, it just put chills through me to watch it, and I hope we can watch it someday soon. But uh, with all that said, I'm just going to have a real short prayer. If we can uh, take a moment, let me have uh, a second, and uh, if we can, if we can do that, I appreciate it. My heavenly Father, please be with us as we confront issues in our world that we've never confronted before at least not on the scale that we're confronting some of these issues locally socially medically it's in our bible you say if we will ask for forgiveness you will heal our country you will heal our world i believe you could translate that as saying i ask for forgiveness for us and I hope we all can in our private way, if we so believe. Uh, amen. Amen. You <coughs> stand and address the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, um, the next item on our agenda would have been a recognition of Tracy Norris Coble, the detention office center officer who is the recipient of the Sheriff's Office Life Saving Award. However, I'm told that uh, Officer Coble could not be with us this evening, so we will postpone that to another date and look forward to seeing Officer Coble get the recognition that's deserved. Uh, the next item on the agenda is public speakers for topics which are related to the meeting agenda. I understand that we have one person who has signed up to speak on an agenda-related item. 
who is asked to be called. That would be uh, Dr. Beulah Mitchell. Okay. I'll to get her on and while the clerk is uh, reaching Dr. Mitchell, I'll just uh, mention that we have uh, three different ways that people can address the board tonight. One would be in person, one would be uh, by a phone call, and one would be um, by having submitted an email with their comment prior to the meeting. So my intention is to go through the list of people who have signed up in advance and um, call those people's, those person's names um, in the order in which they submitted their request. <coughs> And then, you know, if they're here in person, then have them. And then if they wanted to be called, then we'll call them. And the reason for that is to um, give priority to the people who showed the initiative or the, um, the what's the word that I'm looking for? The, the intention early on of being at the meeting or yeah, of addressing the board. Hello. Dr. Mitchell, can you hear me? Yes. This is Tori Frank. Yes, I can. You're being connected to the Alamance County Commissioner's meeting. Thank you. Dr. Mitchell, can you hear me? I'm Amy Gailey. I'm chair of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners. Can yes, I can hear you. Great. Thank you for joining us tonight, Dr. Mitchell. You have three minutes for your public comment whenever you're ready to start. Thank you. The late iconic U.S. Congressman John Lewis once said, when you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have to speak up. You have to say something. You have to do something. Minutes to be acted upon tonight and other accounts verify commissioners Bill Lashley, Tim Sutton, and Board Chair Amy Gailey's remarks made during recent County Commissioner's meeting. Lashley's comments, and you can't do now what we could do when I was on, we used to beat the hell out of them, are a verbal assault on humanity. Who Ever he referred to as them surely did not wish to be physically assaulted in the way he suggested to Sheriff Terry Johnson. Bearing in mind the recent and ongoing civil unrest around the globe, Lashley's comments are a self-indictment of a racist police culture in which he was once a willing participant and continues to instigate. Wondering, Commissioner Lastly, let's roll back the hands of time. Since you publicly admit unlawful behaviors, why not bravely waive qualified immunity and answer to the police misconduct? In so doing, you may be justly prosecuted for self-admitted crimes against human beings. The people you swore to serve and protect. Your more recent feeble attempt to apologize simply layered on more injury. Resign tonight. In the same meeting, Gailey's response as chair was, well, well, well. And then you chuckle with others in the room. According to the public comment, submitted by Reverend Donna Van Horn, this response garnered from Gailey, I will try to do better. Then too, you openly admitted, according to the minutes, that you did not learn until five years ago that every human needs to feel safe and valued. Board Chair J Gailey, step down and the, leave the board since you have proven through your own words and conduct that a racist culture cannot be deconstructed through your inept leadership. Commissioner Sutton, shame on you too. Your inflammatory comments 
in minutes and video further in emphasize insensitivity within the board of commissioners how dare you state you, we've got to start maintaining the mores in this nation and realize that we have them and do what we have to do to enforce them and being sweet and handing out cupcakes on the corner isn't going to get it done shame on you what foolishness you speak time and time again your resignation should be submitted immediately. In conclusion, God grant grace, God grant the county commissioner's wisdom, carriage to resign. All beloved community members, forward I'm together. I'm sorry, Dr. Mitchell, Not your time is up. Um, that's the end of your three minutes. Uh, thank you very much for calling in. <coughs> You're welcome. Um, Madam Clerk, I believe that that was the only public comment that we had related to agenda, purportedly to agenda related items. So that would conclude the public speakers for the first public comment period. Do we have any commissioner's responses? Yeah, I do. I have a, I have a response. That lady, the only racist she knows is the one staring back at her in the mirror. Okay. Um. Well, I'm not going to have to resign. I'll be gone in five months anyway, so why? She'll get her wish. <laughs> <she> <laughs> <So> <laughs> worry about it. But uh, I would say one thing. I was referring to Erie County, Myrtle Beach. The police force seems to agree with what I said because that's exactly what they're doing. They're tightening up on security to see to it that things like what has been happening at Myrtle Beach, Erie County, won't continue to happen. So I'll stand with them any day of the week. Okay, the next item on our agenda is to approve the agenda. Uh, I would have two amendments, or actually I guess three amendments to, um, to ask the board about first um we had put the COVID-19 update as number four under presentations uh so that Stacy Saunders our health director can go ahead and do her presentation for oh yeah first <coughs> so if we could um have a motion to amend the draft agenda to move the COVID-19 update from number four to number one so moved second we have a motion and a second to make that change is there any discussion if not all in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. commissioner carter are you voting on that motion commissioner carter can you hear me i can't i had you on mute i'm sorry ah <laughs> all right thank you commissioner carter votes in the affirmative so we'll move the COVID-19 update to number one. Uh, the second amendment that I would ask about is we have a budget amendment for health under as uh, item 8-1. I would ask that to be moved up to number two under the presentation so that the health director can go ahead and get that knocked out. Make the move that we do that. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to make that change. All in, is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh. Thank you. Commissioner Carter votes in the affirmative, so we will make that change as well. Then the third change would be to add an item to the agenda. Since the preparation of the agenda um, last week, the, in the case NAACP versus Peterman, there's been an amended complaint filed which has added the members of the Board of Commissioners to the defendants and so we would I would seek a motion to add a closed session to preserve the attorney-client privilege <laughs> to um, between the number 12 commissioners comments and number 13 adjournment I make a move that we add that to the agenda second 
We have a motion and a second to add a closed session to preserve attorney-client privilege to the agenda. If there is no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Commissioner, aye. Commissioner Carter votes in the affirmative, so uh, that, mo that motion carries. So next would, uh, item would be to approve the agenda as amended. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the agenda as amended. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Commissioner Carter votes in the affirmative and the motion carries. Next is approval of the consent agenda. I make a move that we approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as amended. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Commissioner Carter votes in the affirmative and the motion carries. All right. Next is Stacy Saunders, our health director with the COVID-19 update. Thank you. Stacy, welcome. Hey, thank we you. We sure hate to lose you. Yes, well, we thank do. Thank you very much. Um, I'll be talking about that at the end, I think. Um, but uh, thank you for having me tonight and thank you for moving your agenda so that I can um, leave afterwards um, and get ready for some other exciting things. <laughs> um, so uh, what you have before you are the daily case counts. Uh, I'm gonna go quickly through the daily case counts and some of the uh, weekly report um, and then answer any questions that you may have. So um, just to remind folks, we identified our first case of COVID-19 um, on March 20th here in Alamance. Um, since then, we have a cumulative case count of 1,727. Um, of that cumulative case count, uh, 1,473 have been released from isolation. Uh, we have 214 active cases in isolation um, as of today, and 15 of those active cases, so included in those 214, 15 of those active cases are receiving care um, in a hospital. That number has um, stayed right around um, a dozen plus or minus a few. And then um, sadly and unfortunately, uh, we've experienced 40 COVID related deaths here in, in Alamance County. And I'll go more in depth than that in, um, later on. Uh, the new cases epi curve, um, also known as the incidence curve. So this is uh, the uh, data visualization that helps us uh, determine how many new cases per day we're having. Um, the cumulative case count um, clearly adds every day, so we see uh, more and more. But the daily um, new cases helps us um, determine how many are coming in uh, per day and helps us derive um, the epi curve and the um, average uh, cases per day. So you can see here um, not as much activity in the beginning, um, low and slow, and then right around uh, Memorial Day, the incubation period after Memorial Day, we started to see a steep incline and reached about 40 cases per day on average and started to see that come down and plateau a bit. Um, and then you see this little rocky place around July 4th. We had our highest number of cases reported on July 4th, uh, which was um, a somewhat unusual, um, but when we did some digging, um, realized that some of the turnaround times for those test results were about seven to nine days out, um, and we're coming in all at the same time. So that that's a, caused that little aberration that you see there. And then um, we had another holiday, July 4th, and you can see in the incubation period following July 4th holiday, we've seen another incline, not quite as steep as the Memorial Day one, but still an incline and seeing about 35 cases per day. This visualization is just to help folks um, see the true burden of um, case investigation and contact tracing. So um, to, your, to the left is the um, confirmed cases, just what I talked about with the daily case count. You see the total of 1,727 broken out by active, released, and deaths. Um, and then the um, 
figure to the right of that are the actual close contacts. So these are the folks who um, have been in close contact with a known case, that'd be six feet for more than 10 minutes, and that they require monitoring as well and quarantine. And so you can see here that we've had a total of 3,253 um, close contacts, 2,665 2, have been released. And currently, as of today, we have almost 600 who are still active. And so this is almost 5,000 individuals who have been monitored um, either through quarantine or isolation to date. I think this is one of the most anticipated uh, visualizations. And so this is the uh, total weekly testing for Alamance County, not just the health department, but the entire um, county, so different providers. And you can see here earlier on in June um, had lower numbers and as um, June progressed and into July, we saw that um, weekly testing increase um, as more providers of collection um, were brought on board here in the county. We currently have a fixed site at the health department, one at Piedmont Health Services on Vaughn Road, um, one at Grand Oaks um, at ARMC, um, Fast Med, CVS, uh, Kernodal Clinic, um, Next Care, and then we also have several uh, community collection events that have occurred during that time as well. Um, the gray trend line that you're seeing is the percent positivity, and we're hovering just around 9%. So of the all the tests collected, about 9% of them are um, ended up being positive. The demographic breakdown hasn't changed that much in the last couple of weeks. Um, this looks almost identical to the last time I was able to talk with you all. We still do see a disproportionate amount of our case burden in our Hispanic population. Um, again, just to remind folks that um, a lot of that associated with uh, work sites, um, close household contacts, um, things like that. Um, before you move on from that, is it okay if I ask some questions? Sure. Because um, I found this to be really interesting and curious because some of the things that I've heard about the reasons that the um, virus has had such a huge disproportionate impact on the Hispanic community are things that I thought were also true possibly of the African American community that the African-American community tends to, I guess, um, live in closer quarters. If I say something that's not right, please correct me. Um, I, I, can you help me to understand how, how is, what is the reason that the virus is so much more impacting the Hispanic community versus the African-American community? If, because uh, as I understand it, African Americans tend to live in more poverty in Alamance County, that they represent a higher percentage of the households with poverty. And I would think that would also be true of the Hispanic population. How are they, how are they different? Why, why isn't that, why is there such a huge disparity between those two things? So uh, first I'll start and say that statewide um, and even nationally that historically marginalized populations are seeing a disproportionate burden of COVID-19, both in the, ca the case burden and, in, and deaths. What you're seeing here for Alamance County is one um, that for our Hispanic population, those cases are often related to work sites where folks are in close contact with each other, they're low paying wages, they're public facing a lot of times, might be construction might be factory work where um, even with social distancing pieces in place, um, it's hard to keep um, six feet at all times. And then um, cultural practices like uh, multi-generational homes and very uh, family-centric um, support systems are also at play here. Usually those are super protective. When we talk about infant outcomes, when we talk about child outcomes, when we talk about maternal outcomes, those multi-generational homes are actually causing much better health outcomes. But when you talk about infectious disease, um, multi-generational homes are also environments where disease can spread pretty quickly. And so what you're seeing here too is that our Hispanic population often will identify as white Hispanic. And so you're seeing um, our white population, and some of this is partly um, due to the um, identification. And so as they identify as white Hispanic, you're seeing our white um, population increase just a little bit too. 
um, and that could be at play here. Nationally and statewide, um, historically marginalized populations, including our black population, are uh, disproportionately affected. I will say when we, when we talk about the deaths, for sure, uh, we've had 40 deaths here in Alamance County. Um, 30, 31 of them were associated with a long-term care facility, but when you break it down um, by race, 35% um, um, were in black population. That is far more than our general population distribution. So you might not be seeing it on the cases, um, but over time as this levels out, you might see that um, over time actually represent that other, the historically marginalized population of African Americans as well. Right now, we, we've just had a large case burden in our Hispanic population. Could it also, the Hispanic population, be impacted by a language barrier? I don't think you mentioned that, or um, the communication of the broader public health objectives or, um, you know, um, interventions within so, the Hispanic population? Is so in general, our historically marginalized populations also tend to have less access to care. Um, and so that sometimes means care that is um, health literacy that's also in culturally appropriate uh, languages and all these things too. I will say here in Alamance, um, our community co collection events um, have had bilingual staff at them. The health department has bilingual staff, so does Piedmont Health Services. Um, Grand Oaks also has them. So um, all of our materials are also in Spanish. Um, and uh, we've done, we've worked with our Cone Health partners and our other partners to make sure that messaging is culturally appropriate and going out to um, outlets um, that our Spanish speakers um, may be listening to or seeing um, rather than our English speaking outlets, um, if that's helpful. Thank you. I've been um, paying a lot of attention to the statistic over the last, well, couple months, and um, it's been a big concern for me. And thank you. Yeah. It is for us too. Um, a lot of our community collection events are um, most certainly focused on our historically marginalized populations. Um, as I said, limited access to care also means um, potentially limited access to transportation. So fixed sites are only good if you can get to them. So community collection events um, that take the collection out to the community are meant to uh, reach populations that may not be able to get to us. Yeah, but that's true of the African American community too, right? That yes. There's often a problem with transportation. Yes. It's just been a puzzle to me that um, a lot of the you know, socioeconomic barriers that the Hispanic community faces are also things that are faced in the African American community in Alamance County and why the disparity and the um, case breakdown. Exactly. So, as I said before, I think some of that has to do with the um, clusters that we've been able to find on work sites that been, have been um, linked to meat packing pla uh, processing plants that have been outside of our county but are largely Hispanic in their employee matrix. In the matrix. Um, and so then with the household contacts from there. And so uh, the community collection events are, t are, like I said, very focused on um, zip codes and neighborhoods and community, um, parts of the community where folks might have um, trouble with access to either care or to transportation. In addition, the health department, um, as we were early on in this response, found that um, some of our cases had no medical home. So no primary care. Um, so we've worked with our um, federally qualified health center partner and been able to establish uh, medical homes uh, for cases because we don't do primary care at the health department. So while we monitor them during their isolation and quarantine, we also connect them with a, a medical home so that if they should need other medical needs during their quarantine and isolation um, that don't warrant a trip to the hospital, um, they have an established medical, they are establishing a medical home and that would uh, carry them after their isolation and quarantine as well. Could you go back to the epigraph for me? I have a question about that. This one? Yeah, so we had a spike around Memorial Day weekend. Has there, and you mentioned um, the outbreaks related to meat packing plants mm -hmm. in, other, in another county. Has there been any outbreak identified specific to A Speedway? Not in, no, not in Alamance County. We've not identified a cluster. There have been a couple of cases throughout the state, but that's it at this point. And those were, I think, the, those were um, participants in the race. There's not been anything with the spectators. Is that right? 
No, I don't think that's right. One was a participant and I think one was a spectator. One was a spectator. Okay, thank you. Let me ask you a rhetorical question. Does there seem to be a pattern at all of whether or not you've received your shots, your immunization shots uh, for other diseases that if you haven't gotten those shots uh, that you're less immune to this possibly? Is there any pattern there at all, do you think? Um, not that I'm aware of, um, and I don't know that that is a part of the assessment necessarily as we're doing our case investigation, um, but I haven't read anything to that effect either. Because we do know there's been unbelievable breakouts of uh, German measles or mumps or whatever, and even a little come back on tuberculosis and so forth and so on, and, and, and I'm not sure what pattern there is for not vaccinating certain immigrants and so forth and so on that might yield less tolerance for something new coming along. I mean, my goodness, if they're going to get German measles or if they're going to get mumps or whatever, you weren't here when we had the breakout in Siler City where they had to send health people in from all over the state down at the chicken plants. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we've also heard of some breakouts lately in some of these same type of meat packing companies and so forth and so on. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, you know, you would think, I would think, if, if you're going to catch measles, if you're going to catch, you know, things that we have been vaccinated against and we don't get anymore much to speak of and, you know, some of the diseases are eradicated, that, uh, if they're going to catch that, they'll catch this more more likely than, than somebody who's had a good immunity system developed but that I, I'm just just questioning I'm not aware of um, any correlation with this particular outbreak mm -hmm. um, now the measles outbreaks that were happening um, last year were uh, more associated with um, folks who chose not to get uh, vaccinated right. um, and, right. and I believe that was um, centric to New York and some other areas oh, sorry uh, your age breakdown hasn't changed much either in the last few weeks. Um, it's mimicking the state um, pretty nicely. Um, no big surprises there. The zip code um, data hasn't really changed over time either. The big four have um, been uh, the top four since the beginning, and those are your two Burlington uh, zip codes, Graham and Mebane, and then with um, smaller burden in um, other zip codes within the county. And this is um, the breakdown of the COVID-related deaths um, by population source, uh, meaning general population versus a long-term care facility or congregate living. And then um, also by doubling. So our first um, death was <coughs> April 23rd and doubled on May 1st and then so on. Our last doubling occurred on June 15th and you can see we haven't doubled since then. Um, but we are, our um, breakdown is 31 of those deaths were um, associated with a long-term care facility and nine associated with um, general population. As I mentioned, um, further breakdown of this data um, shows that 35% of those deaths are in our African-American population. Um, about 90% of the deaths are in um, individuals over 65. And that's the end of that um, could you go back I hate to ask you to do it could, could, at the very first where you showed the 200 and some active versus four yeah that, that yes, right sir. there you know you and I uh, we had that email exchange about uh, you know you got your 1400 released and I was asking you about what you thought academically about those 1400 catching it again and appreciate your reply. And then the very next day, USA Today sent out, I have not read that article, I've still got it. What did that article say? Because it talked about people, like in that 1400 some category, <clears throat> whether or not they could get it again or not. What did it say? I, don't I could not open it. Uh, I knew Seriously. exactly why you were sending it to me and I could not open it because I don't have access to that either. I was hopeful to Google and just sort of see what it was it had said, but I I am not aware okay. of what it I said. I haven't read it either. I, I got to read it though. Well, let me ask you this. I've asked you this one time before, and it's just so I can talk about it logically with people, you know, the best I can. Of the fourteen hundred, uh, yeah, that's released. I mean, let's face it, that's in and out pretty quick, in my opinion. Uh, what are those 1,473 not showing that they were showing when they went in? 
What do you mean? As far as well, I mean they're released. Why? You've oh, I yeah. see. What what caused them to be released? Exactly. What's okay. not showing that was showing? Okay, so the CDC has very um, concrete guidelines around what constitutes someone being released from isolation, and so it has to be at least a minimum a minimum of ten days. Um, for the most part, most people are a little bit more than that, but a minimum of ten days. Um, that you have to be improving in your symptoms. So you might still have a residual cough, but it's improved, right? So you, um, that's the big thing is that your, your symptoms have been resolving and improving and no fever. Um, that guidance just um, changed today. It was no fever um, for 72 hours with no um, anti-fever meds. Um, and now um, it looks like the CDC is changing that to 24 hours. So it's the 10, the 10 day minimum um, and then improving symptoms and then based on fever resolution with no medication. And then you can be released from isolation. And the last time I pulled that data for you, um, it was averaging that most people were somewhere around um, 13 to 14 days before they were released from isolation. Um, I'm happy to pull that again for you to see with our... Um, and I still would like to see, try to see some dialogue about whether or not you know, there's any pattern of people getting it again whether or not they've developed an immunity, the mm -hmm. so-called herd immunity theory, maybe with just that one group. Uh, and and uh, so. Lots to still be learned. Um, so yeah. it seems like we've been in this for a really long time, but when you think about the, the time itself, it's, it, there's a lot to still be learned about mm -hmm. um, how long immunity is, um, if it, you know, how long, how long someone um, has immunity. Um, and so those are things that are being studied. I wish I had a better answer for you um, at a local level. I don't get the privilege of sort of studying that, so I rely on others. Um, but you know, you, you and I haven't talked about this, but I was listening on the radio about uh, Fauci. Is that his name? How you pronounce mm -hmm. his name? He was wanting to try to get some thymus glands uh, to study, and I learned the hard way about what thymus glands were when my wife was sick, mm -hmm. and. Uh, her thymus gland literally had just grown the size of a small grapefruit, they said. It was choking off her respiratory system. She couldn't breathe good. And when they did a CAT scan, <clears throat> they said it was under her breastplate and it was a thymus gland. Well, I go to the library down there, the medical library, and study what the thymus gland was. And it was your first defense mechanism. I think it creates your T cells. Is that correct? T, is that mm -hmm. what the cell is? Mm -hmm. T cell. But it's supposed to die at puberty. And hers had just exploded, you know, way bigger. And I asked her doctor, I said, is it possible that the thymus gland started growing because she had cancer and it was trying to fight it off? Is it, because it is a defense mechanism mm -hmm. organ, supposedly. I guess it would be called an organ. He said, that's as good an answer as I can give you. He said, you know, you, you're helping me understand it. But Fauci was trying to get a hold of some th thymus glands from uh, infants or somebody that had died so that they could study the defense mechanism of, the, of mm -hmm. what the thymus gland would do. I thought that was very interesting. They're trying to find out something. More. Yeah, lots of research happening That was right an now. interesting uh, thing that I heard, I thought. Any other questions about the COVID? I don't have any. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I would like to take this time to say thank you all um, for um, giving me an opportunity to be your health director um, for the last six years. Um, as you're aware, I have um, tendered my resignation and my last day will be July 31st. Um, and so thank you all for your time um, and allow me to come and speak to you and in this space and sometimes speak to you on the phone and um, other spaces. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce to you um, your interim health director, the Board of Health conducted an application process and an interview process and appointed an interim health director, and that's Alex Rimmer. Go ahead, can you say that? <laughs> Hi. Welcome aboard. And um, Alex will begin July 31st at 5 p.m. Um, and <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Make sure there's lots of coverage. Um, Alex is a registered environmental health specialist um, here at the health department. Um, who has been working on on-site and wastewater. Uh, but before she came to us here at the at Alamance County Health Department, she was at Caswell um, County Health Department and has extensive public health um, experience from there too. 
um, and I hope that I'm doing this from memory, has a bachelor's from Liberty and an MPH from UNCG. Um, and so um, I hope that you'll welcome Alex as uh, well as you welcomed me. Um, she's going to be a great asset to, health, to the health department. Um, and thank you all for your, for your support of public health. Well, gosh, Stacey, thank you so much. I mean, what can we say to you, especially after the last four months, with your leadership through public health and the virus and so many other things? We had seen you, you know, sh showing your your medal through the years, and but then the last few months has really given the public a chance to see how um, what a really outstanding professional you are. You're just delightful to work with and always have that um, equanimity which I strive for and um, you just really are a, a great role model and example of graciousness and professionalism and we don't know what we're going to do without you. You know, Alex, <laughs> you got high heels to fill over here. <laughs> Thank you. She um, wears them well and we're just going to miss you a lot. Thank you for that. Um, I appreciate that. I'm going to try not to um, get red. Um, so thank you. I appreciate that. Um, we have had lots of successes and lots of challenges, and um, I appreciate the opportunity to have grown in my leadership here, and I wish you all um, very well. Well, Buncombe County is super lucky to get you, <laughs> and um, we wish you all the best. We know you're going to do great there, and we're going to miss you. And um, you know, when you're driving past on your way to Raleigh, which I'm sure you will do often, you can wave out the window at little Graham Absolutely. as you go by. But please stop and visit. And Thank you. The door's always open. Thank the light's you. on. So. I'll second everything Amy said. That's right. I agree. We're going to miss you. Thank you, Mr. Lashley. You've done a good job. Stay. Well, I have to add, after working with uh, Stacy for over a year, on the health board myself. She's done a fabulous job and she's been a tremendous leader. And uh, after interviewing Alex, I think she'll do a tremendous job as well. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Carter. I think you're right. Um, she's going to do great. Um, if you're ready, I'll go ahead. Sure. Do the budget amendment. If you're ready, let's go ahead and do the I'll budget amendment the for health department. Yeah. <laughs> My last for you. Yes. <laughs> Um, so before you have a budget amendment uh, for the health department, um, if you'll remember, we've received notification of um, funding um, around April, I believe, um, that was in the form of agreement agenda 619. It was for COVID. This was um, not CARES Act money, but came through um, preparedness. Um, that was a short time um, to spend, um, and so we actually had a longer time to spend. And what you're seeing is not necessarily new money, it's just the money that we couldn't spend before the end of the fiscal year. And so we were able to, to spend about 28000 We have 104000 left, um, and that's what you have before you. And um, so far that's been spent on some contracted nursing positions, some um, fans for our collection site because it's gotten awful hot outside. And um, if approved tonight, the, um, the remainder of that money will go into the budget to be continue to be spent on contracted nurses, um, contracted data management, data visualization platform. So um, you have prettier graphs and um, supplies for the collection, um, events like tents, tables and chairs, signage, and updating the trailer that we have that holds all of our um, equipment right now. It needs some updates, um, some shelving and things in there to make it a little bit more user friendly for when we are out and about collecting. Okay, uh, Commissioner Boswell has made a motion to approve the budget amendment and Commissioner Lashley has seconded it. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Commissioner Carter votes aye, and the motion carries 5-0. Thank you all so much thank for all your time. Right, thank you. All right, the next item on the agenda is a resolution to approve the lease purchase of some Hewlett Packard computers. Jeremy Teeter, the finance officer for ABSS, is here. I, you, I have, oh. thank you. I've not learned to manage the glasses mask thing very well. Terrible. And I control, control mine down. <laughs> My goodness. 
It's uh, hard to breathe and, and <laughs> say at the same time. Yes. Thank you. I'm glad you could relate. Um, so, Chair uh, Gailey, uh, Commissioners, and uh, uh, Manager Haygood, um, as you're aware, when we went through our budget process uh, with the school system, uh, we identified um, that we had 8,000 student Chromebooks that were becoming obsolete and we needed to replace those. Um, and so we put that out for bid and we secured a lease uh, to pay for those over a four year period. Uh, the annual payments, 451, 337, and 29 cents. Um, and when we get to the end of that, um, at the end of those four years, we'll still have a couple of useful years on those, and which is a good thing. Um, we did not, um, we're ultimately tonight not seeking additional money from you. We made cuts and adjustments on our own in-house like a lot of folks have done. And so we ultimately just need approval to uh, from you to approve this level of financing due to the dollar amount. Um, but we are taking care of it uh, with our existing resources um, due to making cuts and adjustments on our own. So are you getting everybody ready to go back? We're, we're <laughs> working through the logistics, yeah, so. Um, and I guess these Chromebooks are part of that process? So these were 8,000 we already had, uh, and so they were no longer usable, and we use them every day in school. Okay. And so um, whether the governor had said A, B, or C, we were going to need to replace these 8,000 books. Okay. Yep. Very good. I'll uh, make a motion that we approve this resolution. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Boswell to approve the resolution and a second by Mr. Lashley. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Commissioner Carter votes aye and the motion carries 5-0. Okay. Thank you all so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. All right, we have an interlocal agreement with uh, Alamance County Transportation Authority. Good evening, Commissioners. Before evening. you tonight is a memorandum of understanding for the county to renew with ACTA, which is the Alamance County Transportation Authority. This would give the county the ability to advance funds that would not exceed $320,919. And that is in relation to their three grants, 5307, 5310, and 5311 trips. Um, at this time, ACTA is not requesting any funds um, at this time, but this would go ahead and give us the authority to enter into the agreement and should they make that request, go ahead and issue those funds. I make a motion that we approve it. Second. I thought we were going to keep talking. <laughs> Thank you. We have a motion by Mr. Boswell to approve the interlocal agreement and a second by Mr. Sutton. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Commissioner Carter votes aye. So the motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have a request to set a public hearing for a historic landmark designation. Hello, commissioners. Hello, welcome. Tonight I have something pretty simple for you. How's oh, that? All right. At least we for like one, one trip up here. <laughs> like what y'all have before you is Historic Properties Commission met last month or last week for this month, and they have a proposal for mills that are right near the Granite Mill site in Hall River. These two or two additional buildings are down the street and across the street from each other, still in Hall River, the part of that historic boundary that y'all said earlier this year. So what we're proposing tonight is to bring the public hearing here. It's a formal process that you all do the final approval for that for anything in Alamance County. So we're just looking to set the date and have a public hearing for y'all to hear their uh, information. What is the date? We can do that the first meeting in August or second, whichever. So that'd be August 3rd at nine o'clock? Okay. Is that right? Yes. Make a motion to approve public hearing August 3rd at 9 o'clock. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Boswell to set the public hearing for that historic landmark designation 
for August the 3rd at 9 o'clock in the morning and a second by Commissioner Lashley. Is there any discussion? I'll just say that I had the opportunity to go and look at the um, property and it's quite an undertaking, quite a project, but when it's completed, it's going to be so awesome. I guess and really the tax credits. Is yes. The well, that's the part you approved to give them the local credit. Then right. they go. They're up for national recognition as well. They're going through that process to get the rest of yeah. what they're needing. And that's good. I, I mean, it's good to take these old buildings and use them and use them for something. Oh, and yeah. them down. It's yeah. a lot of work. There's some real special people that do those types right. of projects. Just anybody can't pick that up. Nah. But the guy that's doing this did Mebbin as well, and he's doing Granite Mill, and he'll do the he other did. two. And I believe they white, also white furniture. Is white furniture. Mm -hmm. did? I believe they also did the American Tobacco Campus in Durham. I think you're right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this would be a really an awesome thing for the town of Hall River. I'm really mm -hmm. excited for them to um, have this underway. They've been working for many years to try to get some activity on those mills. So yeah, they have. For sure. Very good. All right. So, is there any more discussion? We have a motion by Mr. Boswell and a second by Mr. Lashley. If there's no more discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Commissioner Carter votes aye and the motion carries five to zero. Great, thank you very much. The next item is a coronavirus relief funds action plan. Well, good evening, commissioners. Good evening. Uh, hey. We've received additional funding from the state uh, for our coronavirus relief fund effort. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what that means. I'll be asking you to consider approving a budget amendment to budget these funds. And then we'll also talk a little bit about the details of the small business loan program that we talked about at uh, our last meeting. So I'm gonna go through this information. And as I do, if you have any questions, please uh, just, just stop me and we'll talk about it. So just to remind the commissioners uh, where we are to date with our coronavirus relief funds, the state uh, allocated CARES Act monies to the counties uh, and we were able to use these funds for costs from last fiscal year as well as this fiscal year. And uh, the state has created the North Carolina Pandemic Recovery Office. That's the new state agency that oversees the use of these funds. So uh, we've had uh, employees working closely with NC Pro to learn how to use these monies and make sure we're using them uh, correctly. Originally, if you'll recall, the first round of funding that Alamance County received was three million seven thousand nine hundred and sixty seven dollars uh, and we are being told we are going to receive a new allocation of CARES Act money in the dollar amount of three million two hundred eighty nine thousand eight hundred and twenty two dollars so our total amount of CARES Act money received by Alamance County will now be six million two hundred ninety seven thousand seven hundred and eighty nine dollars if you recall we've already budgeted the original allocation uh, and we approved a budget amendment We've, we've used it for uh, all kinds of different purposes. We've spent some recently for hazard pay bonuses for employees. Uh, so we're starting to, to spend that money now. But uh, to give you an idea of what we're looking at to do with the $6.2 million, we're going to budget 3.1 million of it to cover public health and safety salaries. I want to say that this is our original attempt to budget this money. We can't adjust later if we find other things that we want to do with the money. Uh, but for right now, we need to budget it some way. This is the way that we're proposing to budget it. We have $840,000 budgeted for hazard pay. Uh, we spent one round of that already. We're, we're thinking that could come back again in the fall. If we have another round two of coronavirus, if things get worse. Uh, we are also being required by the state now, and I'm gonna talk about this in a moment, uh, the, the county had the option of giving money to the cities in the first round. That is no longer the case. The state is uh, dictating to the county that you must give 25% of the total amount of funding to the municipalities. So that $1.5 million is the 25% the state requires that we make available to the cities. And again, I'll talk about that in just a moment. And then we're proposing to budget $638,000 uh, for some compliance to do a couple of technological projects that I'll talk about here in just a moment. And then we still have $100,000 uh, of our original funding dedicated for elections, to, for PPE and what other kind of election costs we can't foresee right now uh, due to COVID. But just, just to talk a minute about uh, what we plan to do with the compliance monies, as you saw, I'm proposing to budget $638,778. What we're planning to do with this money is do some technological upgrades. Uh, you, I'm sure you're aware the court has been using this space and has used it several times for streaming. You know, the court is working very hard to social distance. 
but to still meet their caseload. And one way they're able to do that is by streaming video so they don't have so many people come into court to see. So we're, we're proposing to take some of this $600,000 and go up to the historic courthouse and set the court up to where they can do their streaming there. They would much prefer to do their cases in a courtroom as opposed to this room. They have been very grateful to where you have a day not, uh, to be able to use the space, but they would much prefer to use their, their own. So we're gonna propose to use some of this funding to do that project. And then as we're continuing, we are continuing to work with county employees to try to figure out ways to get them uh, uh, home, frankly. If they can do their jobs at home, if they can be accountable, if the supervisors can hold them accountable and they can still deliver the, the service that we need, we're encouraging people to telework. That's gonna take some additional laptops and additional equipment, so we're proposing to use a portion of this $600,000 to purchase uh, additional laptops and some other equipment to send more folks uh, uh, into the teleworking force. And then we're also, we've met and talked with Jeremy of our tax department. As you know, billing season's coming. Uh, we typically have very large crowds on the first floor when people are coming in to pay their taxes. We usually have lines uh, out into the lobby. They're very long. We socially distance. I suspect we will have lines outside the door, possibly down to Maple Street. So we've talked with Jeremy and are looking at a piece of property that we could lease for six months that has a drive-in window. So uh, Jeremy and his folks have been over and looked. We think That's it would be very, idea. It, it, uh, we believe great it would be idea. very effective, particularly for our senior citizens yeah. who are looking is to- it here in Graham? It is, it is uh, if it's not in Graham, it is right on the border of Graham and Burlington. And I'll be bringing a lease to you next month. Uh, so I, once we get the particulars, uh, I can assure right. you that Jeremy's looked at it, found it very accommodating. They're very excited about the possibility of offering drive-up uh, tax collection services. Make sure that we advertise Absolutely. that location. Yeah. Yes, because uh, bills are preparing to go out. So Jeremy feels like we have enough time to, uh, if we move, and we're moving on it now. I think IT and county maintenance are over there looking to see what would need to be done just to upfit it to, for Jeremy to put a few staff people there and get the drive-in window up and ready. And get that on their, on their bill. That's correct. That, that, that would be the goal is yeah. when the bill goes out, it says yeah, come to this location to pay your bills if you want to do um, drive-in service. So we're proposing to use some of this $638,000 to pay the lease. We can use these funds, the coronavirus funds, to pay the lease payment. We can also use the funds to pay the operating costs, so like heat, lights, uh, water bill, those kind of things. And we're also going to use some of it to upfit. There's not a lot of upfit needed because Jeremy's only planning to send a, a handful of people there. And we wouldn't be letting the public in the building. It's really just about the drive-in window. So installing a couple of workstations, some security uh, for the building I would be it's most convenient to get around the building. Yes, it's, uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you about the building at August 3rd, but it is a really good site, lots of parking, very easy to get in and out of. I think it would be very beneficial for tax and, and Jeremy tends to agree. So we're all very excited about it. Uh, and excited that we can use these coronavirus monies to do that too. So. Um, and then, could you go back for just a second? Sure. I just wanted to make a comment that, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm really excited to see the equipment for court streaming on there. The burden that the virus has placed on the court system in the state has been really remarkable. And I know it's been very, very difficult for them to try to catch up with their delayed dockets and people need to go to court, you know, and they have their lives are in limbo mm -hmm. while they're waiting. And then the, the bureaucracy of the court system has really struggled to get through the changes and things. And so everything that we can do with these coronavirus relief funds to help alleviate that burden, that's what the money's for. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm really, really excited to see that there. I have to say that I think I feel like our relationship from county government to the court system is very good and strong, and they have been very appreciative, but we look at our role as facilitating their needs. That's our statutory role, and we feel like this is an excellent use of the money and, and getting them set up to where they can stream. People are interested in these cases, and keeping if we can work with them to help keep uh, folks out, but they can still see the proceedings, that would be, that would be excellent. And that's one thing I want to say about, you know, as you've come forward with your ideas about how to use this uh, relief funds, one of the things I've appreciated is that you haven't sort of tried to find a sneaky way to, to increase the fund balance by displacing money from here to there. 
there's always been a clear yeah, intention. Ryan wouldn't do that, Amy. I, well, he wouldn't. Well, I do That's like fun belts. For it, but right another on. county manager or maybe a city manager might think about trying to do that, um, balance the budget off the clear and uh, fire relief had, funds. We've had some managers that have done that. <laughs> Uh -huh. And I just appreciate that you keep in mind what the purpose of the money is, is that it's not right. to kind of be an extra source of revenue to, to bolster the county's general financial picture. Sure. It's money that has been set aside for fighting the virus and dealing with the impact of the virus in the community. And the good thing is when the virus is gone, this some of that stuff stays in place. So that's... Yeah. Well, we're, we're, we're going to do we'll like different from here on out. That's we'll we'll certainly, if, uh, for example, this, yes. this drive-in tax collection site, if it is successful, then it's something we will be considering as we go forward. Coming in to the security and yeah. all that, yeah. And yeah. we'll be working with Jeremy once we get it up and running to to talk about are there other uh, functions that we could possibly offer there, like uh, either uh, information distribution, if there are forms that county government has and other offices that we could put there. So we're, 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 we see a lot of potential. I think um, City of Burlington has this uh, downtown. They have a drive through window in one of the former banks for like they, right. they take lots of different types of collection there but starting with tax Jeremy's very concerned about he knows we get a lot of uh, folks that come into this building that are of the demographic that would be susceptible to COVID so having it where they don't even have to get out of their cars they, just, right. they, they like to come in and pay in person and if we can accommodate that through a, a drive up uh, I think it actually has two windows one with the tube and the other one with the, the uh, window itself so I'll, I'll, uh, we're working on the particulars of the lease, uh, working with the uh, county attorney to put all that together. I'll be coming back August 3rd uh, with that proposal. So um, excited about how we can spend the money to, to uh, make some technological and facility uh, improvements that'll help folks stay healthy. And then, as I said, the state is now requiring that we uh, budget 25% of our total, the whole 6.2 million must now be given and shared with municipalities. That's the $1.5 million. So if you'll recall originally from our first round, we, we, we decided, the commissioner said, we'll give 600,000 to the cities. Uh, so we did that and we, we allocated it out to the cities. We asked all 10, do you, do you have any need? We only heard back from, I believe seven. There were three that did not respond uh, or said they just didn't really feel like they had enough COVID related expense. So we did a hybrid method of uh, allocation of the $600,000. Uh, we were very close to several of their, we were able to fund their, several of their requests. Some of the requests for the three largest cities were too large, so we used a per capita method to do it. I'm not proposing to change that. Those dollars are allocated. We're not going to change that. But that leaves us with $974,447 to budget and make available to the cities. I am proposing, per this budget amendment, uh, that we do that per capita for all 10 We'll, we'll, we take their population, we break the 974 down based on their population, then, uh, uh, and I'll show you a chart of how it breaks down here in just a moment. We'll let each one of the 10 cities know, here are the dollar amounts now available for you. They have to submit a plan to us by September 1st that shows us if uh, they're gonna be able to spend this money. So here's how it breaks down. In this chart, you can see the first allocation, that was from the first, the first grouping of money. The second allocation is what they would get in new dollars and then the total in the third column is what each municipality in the county would be eligible to receive and it all totals up to the 1.5 million swepsonville alamance and ossipee originally indicated they did not uh, feel they could justify covid funds we're going to go back to them and tell them here are your dollar amounts that you could have access to do you need them if they don't we'll put their money back in the big pot and split it up by uh, per capita just like we did the other dollars so we feel like this is a fair way to do it. This, they have to demonstrate to us their plan by September 1st. So they have to show us what they're gonna do with it. And we'll be working with them. I think we're getting ready to start uh, training with them this week uh, because we've got to make sure they're compliant. Right? So before we'll we're give them any funds. Right? Absolutely, yes. So they'll tell us how they would like to spend the money. We'll work with them to put together, help put together their plan. We'll share their plans with NC Pro and make sure that their uses are compliant. So. Um, so the first item for the board to consider this evening is a budget amendment that budgets these funds and makes these things happen that, that I've talked about. The second item for the commissioner's consideration is uh, the small business loan program. 
Um, I know that Chair Gailey and Vice Chair Carter have been involved in this development of this program. I think there are a lot of folks that are very excited about its potential. Uh, if you remember, the commissioners uh, allocated $200,000 for this uh, small business loan program. Can you pause right there for yes. a second? Can we use some of the new funds to increase that yes. allocation? Absolutely. Can we visit that topic later? Yes. Once we get this up and running? Yes. That would be good. So I would like that. So this is one area where we are offsetting with general revenues. What we found and, and what I understood from all the, uh, hey, Mac, uh, what I understood from the discussions with NC Pro was if we use the coronavirus monies, uh, the small loan program, uh, there's a lot of reporting requirements and it gets a little bit complicated. What we're proposing to do with the budget amendment for the small business loan uh, program is we will use county dollars, but offset the county dollars with 200,000 of coronavirus monies, right? So we will find a place in the budget that we will say, okay, we already budgeted 200,000. We're now gonna use that 200,000 for the small business loan program, and we're gonna plug in coronavirus monies here. Um, it, it makes it easier for us to manage this program, and small businesses will still be able to, uh, to participate. Um, the parameters are still being developed. I'm going to go over what's in place right now because we, we really like to get the commissioner's blessing on the things that are in place so we can get this program rolling because people are needing these dollars. Uh, but the, there's been a committee, the Small Business Loan Committee, has been uh, formed and working on this uh, program. It includes members from the Alamance Community Foundation, Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Small Business Center at ACC, as well as uh, Chair Gailey and um, Vice Chair Carter. So, uh, the plan is to, once this is in place, we'll use a joint marketing effort with the Chamber of Commerce and all of these partners to get the word out to uh, small businesses in Alamance County. This program exists. Come and take advantage of it. Uh, and the, the foundation also will have a, a, a loan program in place, too, that we'll be doing joint marketing efforts uh, together. We're also working with the Small Business Center at ACC. They're gonna be a part of this small business loan process by offering technical assistance to help businesses apply for the funds and also to help them navigate code, right? They, they, to help them survive uh, or be more likely to survive this pandemic. The goal would be to uh, have, if the commissioners are satisfied with the, with the parameters that are uh, known tonight, our goal will be by August 1 to have this thing up, marketed and, and, and ready to go. So just a few, this is not an exhaustive list of the terms of the, uh, uh, of the description of who can borrow and the terms of the loan, but you, I want you to hear this, commissioners, so we can get uh, a blessing from you to proceed with this. So as far as who can borrow the money, what business can participate, the business, uh, the committee has deemed that the business needs to be located in Alamance County, obviously. We want to support Alamance County businesses. Uh, be shooting for businesses with 25 or fewer full-time employees, as well as uh, under $2 million in annual revenue. They must have uh, uh, not have any unsatisfied judgments or tax liens, so they have to have a, uh, as good a operating record as we can get uh, from them. They need to have been in business continuously since April 1st of last year. And they need to be able to demonstrate that they are uh, either still open or they're closed because of the pandemic, uh, the pandemic prevention order. Something from the state has closed their business. And one point that's being discussed at this time, is my understanding, is the uh, the requirement of a, a excuse me a credit report uh, or not. That that is uh, being reviewed. So these are just not all of the terms of who could borrow the money, but a pretty good overview of what the committee has come up with so far. And then from as far as the terms of the loan, what, what has been discussed and put in place at this point is the loans would range from $5,000 to $25,000. Uh, the loans would be, the proceeds would be used to help the business recover from uh, what COVID has done to their business. And that third bullet, rent, mortgage, payroll, just about any COVID related cost, these funds could be uh, used for by the business. Uh, the business would not be required to make a payment for six months for six months, interest does accrue during that time, but it could be extended. So if in six months, they're still not able to make a payment, uh, you can extend. What, uh, what kind of rate are we talking about? Uh, we're, we're working with Self-Help Credit Union, uh, which was the company that we talked about the last time, and they're uh, talking 4%. So um, maximum term, you see the terms there. Uh, they vary from 42 to 66 months, uh, depending on the dollar amount that the business is borrowing. 
4% fixed interest rate and there would be no fees for folks to apply uh, or any of that kind of stuff. So, um, this is a quick overview of who can borrow and what the terms are going to, to look like of the, of the loan. And Chair Gailey and, and Vice Chair Carter, as I'm going through this, if y'all have any input or anything you want to say about these terms, just jump right in. But th this is my last slide. I, the next steps that I can see is uh, if the commissioners would consider uh, and possibly vote to approve the budget amendment that puts the six, all $6.2 million in play for uh, coronavirus relief funds includes, and that includes $200,000 for the small business loan that could be added to later on. If it's one, if it's successful and we get a lot of businesses and we're able to put more money into that program, that would be great. Uh, we, we, we hope to be able to do that. Do you need a motion? Well, we do need a motion to approve that budget. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Lashley and a second by Mr. Sutton to um, approve the CRF budget amendment, including the small business loan. Is there any discussion? Sounds like a good thing. Yeah, thanks for kind of great idea. Okay, if there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Commissioner Carter votes aye, and the motion carries 5-0. Second item for the commissioners to consider uh, with this is uh, those parameters that I went over. I know I went over them quickly. I'm happy to go back to them, but what you saw about who can borrow and what the general terms of the loan program will be, if the commissioners agree that is uh, uh, a good foundation for this program, then uh, I would ask that the commissioners uh, vote and uh, we'll move forward. Back up and Sir, talking about Brian. And I, Commissioner um, uh, Chair Gailey or Commissioner Carter or Mac, if anyone has anything they want to add about the small business loan program, I, I haven't been as involved as uh, you folks have, so I'm happy to defer to anything else that you feel like is important to say. You had something to say, Mac? <laughs> Go ahead. I'm going to take my glasses off. Well, that's the that, yeah, that problem. Yeah, hey, it really is a problem. So. Can you understand me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, first, I want to thank the county for making this adjustment from using CRF funds to unrestricted county funds. Uh, the addition of that 200000 will really bolster the program uh, and that's allow us to help more people out of the gate. Uh, the uh, intent of this is to be a tool not just to get past COVID, but more long term. We haven't had a, 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 a non-traditional lending program that we can add to our economic development toolbox in the past. And so having this as an ongoing tool beyond this immediate moment will be a very important thing. Number two, I think that it's a public-private partnership uh, is important. Uh, and it's one that we set this up so that others, public and private, can contribute to this fund going forward. Uh, and we can build the amount of capital available for lending uh, further out so I'm very excited at this initial uh, base uh, we've got a very capable lending institution uh, that has come up with the program they will implement it and administer it they know what they're doing in that regard I don't know how to do a loan program don't want the responsibility for one so uh, uh, and I think the community foundation is a great partner the MOU with them and the, and the self-help is what you've approved so the partnerships are knowledgeable people. The funding is solid. Uh, the intent uh, is to help uh, particularly marginalized communities and, and people to, to, to help their businesses move forward and, 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 and get through this pandemic and, and, be, uh, and, and recover. So I'm, I'm very excited about it. I thank you all for your contribution to it. Uh, Steve and Amy have been part of this committee as we've been meeting and trying to get all these uh, these uh, conditions approved to, for you all to consider tonight. So I thank them for their work as well. So I, don't, I think that's all I've got to say. And I uh, would, would yield to back to Amy and Steve for any comments on what they will have. Thank, thank you, you ma'am. Commissioner Carter, did you have any comments you wanted to make? <clears throat> Uh, sorry, so I had it back on uh, <laughs> on mute. Um, 
I just think this has been a, a really good effort all around between the uh, various aspects of the community to try and come up with a program to help some of our small businesses, and I'm glad that, uh, that we've been able to participate in it. I hope this program works, and I hope that we can finalize it in such a way that we can see some benefit to help some of our small businesses survive in Alabama County. Yeah, definitely. Um, we've had government, the hand of government has interfered with our operations. They have been closed and forbidden under penalty of law from earning the living which they have pursued for so many years. And um, they still have their property taxes, they still have their fire inspections, they still have their health inspections, they have fees, things that they have to pay. Um, things that they're required to buy in order to uh, keep their licenses and and so forth, their fees. It's uh, a lot of government expenses and um, it just uh, has been a burden on my heart to think that uh, the government shuts you down but then the government bills you for your business that you're not allowed to operate because of the shutdown. And so I really hope that as we go forward with the uh, you know, once this program gets started and um, proves itself that we'll be able to put more money in it from the other coronavirus relief funds and make it bigger because I've talked to quite a few small business owners and they're seriously struggling. There are people who have not been allowed to open and for, month, for I think this is the fifth month that they have no income. And... Um, I'm just really pleased that this board has made this a priority. So if the, if the commissioners uh, feel comfortable with these general parameters for who would be eligible to borrow and what the, the general parameters for what the terms would look like, we will, the committee will be dialing these in in more detail than what I'm showing you here. But this is this is the, the, the real framework for how the program will, will function. Um, yeah. I'd also like to take a minute to praise Andrea Rollins and Mimi Rogers. That's Mimi's last name, right? Clemens. Clemens, I'm sorry. Where did I get Mimi Rogers from? Is that an actress? actress. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Mimi Clemens. Because uh, they have done a lot of work on this, and dealing with the NC Pro, I'm sure, is about... Not a lot. Probably about as much fun as walking around July 20th, 2020 at 2 o'clock in the afternoon in the Walmart parking lot, you know. <laughs> it's probably not a whole lot of fun and pretty uncomfortable. So we really appreciate uh, their hard work in getting this together. Indeed. So you want a motion on that? Yes. That we, I make a motion. We approve the parameters of set forth there. Brian? <clears throat> Do you might want to make a second? I can't hear a lot of really what's going on, to be quite honest about it. Yeah, second. <laughs> this right. is ridiculous out here. I'm not kidding. I'm sorry. We have a motion by Mr. Boswell and a second by Mr. Sutton to approve the small business loan parameters as presented. Is there any more discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Commissioner Carter votes aye, and the motion carries 5-0. Good job, man. Thank you. Lucky, Tim. I couldn't hear either. Is that I, I, is that legal out there? What's going on? City of Graham gave him permission to do it. Mm, 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 mm. All right. Next item on the agenda is RHA Health Services contract renewal. Thank you, uh, commissioners. Uh, so in 2016, Cardinal Innovations returned uh, the county's maintenance of effort funds to Alamance County to manage. The commissioners recall these funds are designated by statute uh, to specifically be used for mental health and substance disorder treatment use. Since that time, the county has continued to fund RHA to provide mental health substance abuse uh, disorder crisis services. Uh, RHA is our uh, uh, provider for crisis services in Alamance County. In 2019, Alamance County developed an RFP process to open the bidding up for crisis services in Alamance County. And uh, the Justice Advisory Council, the JAC, 
awarded the contract to RHA to, to continue to provide our crisis service in Alamance County. Since that time, RHA has continued to do so, uh, and they've increased their hours of service, uh, which has been a tremendous asset uh, to citizens of Alamance County. They've gone, uh, uh, extended their open hours Monday through Friday, and are also open uh, weekends also. So uh, we, we've been very excited about the, the great work that RHA is doing. So at this point, rather than continuing to do an annual renewal of the contract with RHA, uh, we've proposed to the JAC that we seek to do a contract with RHA for multi-years. In fact, we're looking at and proposing for the commissioners to approve tonight a three-year contract with RHA to provide our uh, <coughs> crisis services in Alamance County. That would be for fiscal year 2021, 21, 22, and 22, 23. Each year, uh, the annual MOE disbursement would be $1,085,000. These MOE funds, please remember, are ones that we are required by law to spend on mental health services. But due to the amount of the contract, uh, the Justice Advisory Council must request that the Board of Commissioners approve the contract. So uh, I can tell you from uh, the perspective of the County Manager's Office, I have been very pleased with RHA. I think they've done a fine job uh, for the past three years. Uh, they've been our crisis provider much longer than that. I've had the privilege of working with them for the past three years personally. They've done a fantastic job and they really uh, went above and beyond to uh, expand the hours and that was much needed. People are having mental health crisis. I think the sheriff can attest that happens after five, happens on weekends, mm -hmm. and it's really, really good to have a place uh, to take folks. So we have with us Sarah Huffman, who is the Regional Director of Operations for RHA, and I'd like to ask her to, to say a few words. So Sarah, if you would please come on up. Welcome. Thank you. Um, good evening and thank you um, for this opportunity to speak with you all. Um, I'm here to talk about the partnership with RHA Health Services and Alamance County Government um, that has been in place since 2010 um, and most recently with the county um, controlling those funds since 2016. Um, Alamance County has always valued mental health services um, and in 2010 when the local um, LMEs divested they really put the faith into crisis services for Alamance County um, and a lot of Alamance County citizens have benefited from those services um, so we currently are the initial drop-off for law enforcement we average about 30 law enforcement drop-offs per month this is an alternate place so that law enforcement doesn't have to go to the jail or to the hospital and wait for hours. They are in and out of our center within five minutes. Um, we currently serve over 150 people in the crisis center per month and over um, 60 people within the jail. Those maintenance of effort funds um, fund therapists, psychiatrists, nurses, and security, as well as a jail team um, with a psychiatrist and a case manager um, within the jail. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. I would ask, but I probably couldn't hear you, so. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think y'all do a wonderful job. Thank you. And I know the sheriff appreciates it. We appreciate that partnership as well. Um, very good. All right. Thank you. Thanks Thank for being you here for tonight, coming. Sarah. We, we appreciate the, all the good work that RHA does. The contract, uh, the proposed contract is in your packet and would be for three years, and the dollar amount's $1,085,000 per year. Do you need a motion? Yes, yes, please. I moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Lashley and a second by Mr. Boswell to approve that contract renewal is there any discussion if not all in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. Uh. commissioner carter votes aye and the motion carries 5-0 all right um we have a budget amendment for the home and community care block grant Good evening again, Commissioners. Um, before you is a request to increase the county's budget by $12,767. This is for our home and community care block grant, which are past three dollars that we receive that are for our aging population. Uh, we based our fiscal year 2021 adopted budget was based on estimates 
These are, are the firm figures that we have received from um, Piedmont Regional Trial Council. I'll move that we approve it. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Lashley and a second by Mr. Boswell to approve that budget amendment. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. Commissioner Carter votes aye, and the motion carries 5-0. Let's take a 15-minute recess. All right, recess is over. Let's get back to work. Um, next item on the agenda is public speakers for things that are not agenda related. <clears throat> Before we begin the second public comment period, I'm going to go over the public comment policy to remind the public about uh, the rules that the board has duly adopted over the years related to public comments. <clears throat> The public comment policy is available to be viewed on the uh, web page for the commissioners. So, <coughs> excuse me. So we have a public comment period at the beginning and the end of each regularly, regular monthly commissioners meeting. Um, this is the public comment period at the end of the meeting. So this uh, speaker comments during the second public comment period may be on any topic of public interest. Each public comment period is limited to a maximum of 30 minutes. So when I call the first speaker to the uh, podium, that 30 minute time period will begin. Um, the commissioner shall have a commissioner's response period immediately following the public comment period for follow up or addressing issues that arise from the public comment section. This shall be a point of response from commissioners to respond to comments that have been made, not debates with the public. <clears throat> Each person desiring to speak during the public comment period shall have three minutes to make his or her remarks. There shall be no more than three speakers on any one topic per meeting. While I've been chair, I have interpreted that to be uh, three speakers in support of a topic and three speakers who are opposed to a topic. It is recommended that speakers desiring to speak on the same topic and advocating the same position choose one person to speak for all. And uh, if when a, a speaker comes to the podium, I will ask that person what they intend to speak about and whether they intend to speak in support or opposition to that topic. And um, once the person begins to speak, if it becomes apparent that that person was not forthright in what they uh, said at the beginning that they intended to speak about, then I will ask that person to uh, return to their seat or uh, will discontinue the phone call if it's a phone call. <coughs> um, we have, I think, some emails too, but that's kind of obvious what it's about. So. Um, you know, it has happened in the past where a person has said that they intended to speak on something. Um, there had already been three speakers advocating the same position, and as their comments developed, it became apparent that they had not been forthright about their intentions. And at that time, I allowed that person to continue, but that was that one time. Um, tonight, we had uh, Dr. Mitchell who said she was speaking about an agenda item as her comments unfolded, uh, it became apparent that she was not really talking about the minutes, she was talking about the substance of prior meetings. And so that was not really legitimately an agenda related item. However, in my discretion as chair, I allowed the phone call to continue because she was the only person in the 30 minute comment period. Tonight we have quite a few people who have signed up to speak on a variety of issues. And so if we have three speakers who uh, have already spoken about an item, if I allow the fourth one to continue in the same vein, then it prohibits other people from having the opportunity to speak possibly during that 30 minute comment period. And so the intention that I have in uh, enforcing the rules is to make sure that everyone is treated fairly, everyone is treated the same, and that we keep in mind that lots of people have things that they want to say and when one person uh, 
does not obey the rules, then it possibly prohibits, prohibits another person from having the opportunity to be heard. With this board, in the years that I've been on it, has had people speak about, um, we've had a number of controversial issues that have come up, including the snow camp quarry, the, um, the issues with immigration and the ICE contract, We've had issues with the Mountain Valley Pipeline. We've had issues with school funding. And those uh, people who were concerned about those things were treated, I hope, fairly and consistently. And that is my intention tonight, is to treat everyone fairly and consistently. And I hope that as we progress uh, in the months and years to come, that this board will continue to treat people fairly and consistently and respectfully. Um, so, a uh, speaker shall be acknowledged by the, ch the chair and shall be allowed to speak only in the order oh, designated. A, the sounds I was hearing. I'm sorry, Mr. Carter, are you... Mr. I'm sorry, I should have muted. Okay. <laughs> uh, you would be allowed to speak in the order designated. Now, tonight we are going to go through the people who have signed up in advance and uh, whether or not I think that uh, the majority of them are uh, here in person and we have I think at least one person who is requested to be called so we're going to go through the list of people who have signed up in advance um, and then pause for the person who requests to be called if we get that far in the 30 minutes um, Speakers shall address the board from the lectern at the front of the room and begin their remarks by stating their name and address Speakers who require accommodation for a disabling condition, please uh, contact us no less than 24 hours prior to the meeting, and we're glad to attempt to accommodate any kind of condition that people would um, need addressed. Public comment is not intended to require the Board of Commissioners to answer any impromptu questions. Speakers shall address all comments to the commissioners as a whole and not to individual commissioners. Discussions between speakers and members of the audience shall not be allowed. Speakers shall be courteous in their language and presentation. Failure to abide by this requirement may result in forfeiture of the speaker's right to speak. Speakers who have prepared written remarks or supporting documents are encouraged to leave a copy of such remarks and documents with the county clerk. Speakers shall not discuss any of the following. Manners which concern the candidacy of any person speak seeking public office, including the candidacy of the person addressing the county. Um, matters which are closed session matters, including but not limited to matters within the attorney-client privilege, anticipated or pending litigation, personnel, property acquisition, and matters which are made confidential by law. And um, I'll emphasize that speakers shall not discuss any matters which are closed session matters, including but not limited to matters within the attorney-client privilege, anticipated or pending litigation. Speakers shall not use profanity, and speakers shall not use racial slurs. Um, and finally, speakers shall not engage in personal attacks that by irrelevance, duration, or tone may threaten or perceive to threaten the orderly and fair progress of the discussion. Uh, I'll also mention to the public that uh, there is a pending lawsuit uh, NAACP versus Peterman, which an amended complaint has been filed since uh, the agenda was drafted last week. The amended complaint names each of the commissioners in their official capacity as defendants in a federal lawsuit. And therefore, our uh, county attorney has advised the board not to make any remarks about the subject matter of the lawsuit which is pending in any respect. Do you, any commissioners have uh, anything to add to that? Okay. That being said, the first person on our public comment sign-up sheet is Quinson Ellison.
Good evening. And if you would please start by stating your name and your resident where you reside. Okay. My name is Quinslyn Ellison. I live in Alamance County. And I'm here today. I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here. Um as I address this board, I just address this board with many concerns. Many concerns as a resident of Alamance County, a mother raising children in Alamance County, um, just collective having friends, family here. This place is what I've called home for my 35 years of being here. And over the last couple of years, I've watched racist actions grow. I have, I worked for the Department of Social Service for several years, six years. So I, I, I watched the oppression of black people and brown people on that level. But watching it Dis being displayed in such a public manner from our commissioners and people that we elect to represent us is painful. Um, the expectations of you guys are to uphold this county. It, you guys should be accountable for the things that are said behind those platforms. We, the citizens of Alam Alamance County, should be able to trust that the people that hold these positions will make sure that things are done equally for all people. We, we have attempted to demonstrate, to make, to push necessary changes, but our demonstrations are labeled as threats and attacks we come in peace and we come seeking change. And I do ask personally that you guys will take some of the blinders off and take the time to realize how the citizens feel, the people who pay taxes and different things into this county um, and take the time to be held accountable for the things that are happening behind the platforms that you guys um, have. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Ms. Ellison. <clears throat> uh, next on the list is Dr. Rochelle Ford. Hi, good evening. I'm Rochelle Ford, and I'm just a new resident to Alamance County. I was recruited here by Elon University after serving approximately 25 years in higher education. My expertise is in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I've been really excited to see the community, particularly our police and law enforcement officers, members of various towns and boards, to come together to talk about how we can improve our county. I moved here with my children. I moved here partly also because my family are from North Carolina. My paternal grandparents were born here. According to my genealogy, we know the plantation that my family was owned. We know that the owner of the plantation fought in the, in the Confederacy. Therefore, I am a daughter of the Confederacy. I recognize that people who fought need to be remembered. I recognize that they also fought to maintain the institution of slavery. Just like the Nazis no longer wave the flags of Nazism, there are no statues, there are no statues, commissioners, in Germany representing the Nazis. It's a blemish on Germany. When I moved here and I've had family members to come here, it pains them to see, as it pained me to see, the Confederate statue 
in our town square. I know that Alamance County, I've met with, I'm a member of Leadership Alamance. I know our desire to bring business and industry into our community. The tax base, the diversity that Elon University brings to this community. Therefore, it is critical that we make this an inclusive community. It is critical that we work together. So I'd like the pledge that we said, all of us putting our hands on our hearts, standing at the American flag, that we're one nation under God, indivisible, with life, liberty, and justice for all. All of our representations, when we go into the county seat to do business, whether it's jury duty, to do whatever we need, it needs to be representative of all of our community. I'm gonna continue to work here, to live here, to pay my taxes, to do community service here, but I also wanna make sure that as you all said in opening prayer, that we can look to our children to say that we've done something to make this community better. I implore you therefore, as our county commissioners, to definitely vote to make a change, relocating the statue and working towards our community to be more inclusive of all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Next on the list is Amy Cooper. My name is Amy Cooper. Um, I live at 2723 May Drive in Burlington. I've been a Burlington resident my whole entire life. I'm a mom of five wonderful children and I run a small program called Advocates for Alamance that provides a voice for incarcerated individuals in the community. I have 180 seconds to express my concern over recent events. That is nowhere near long enough, but I guess it's a start. I'm ashamed of our community. I'm ashamed that an unarmed black teen was shot in the back while fleeing in Graham and no one is being held accountable. It's concerning to me, while there is a rule in place about body cameras, that this particular event wasn't recorded until three minutes after Mr. Light was shot. If we do not hold the police accountable for not wearing a body cam, what reason do they have to comply with the rules? What else has not been recorded that should have been? What can we do moving forward that will ensure every officer has a reason to comply with the rules set in place for body cams? I'm ashamed of the events that were allowed to transpire during a prayer walk in our county. There were two distinct sides. One side was allowed to engage in unlawful behavior, including damaging county property and lewd gestures to the public, while another man was arrested and charged with a misdemeanor for using profane language in public, which I thought was freedom of speech. Um, I'm ashamed that there is even a debate over removing a statue that has been referred to by multiple media outlets as a lightning rod for violence. I'm ashamed that when I go to downtown Graham and my kids ask to go with me, I have to tell them that they can't. It's too dangerous. I'm ashamed to live in a county where standing up for what is right at one point was punishable by law. I'm ashamed that our city and county officials have added to the current conflict instead of leading by example and doing the right thing. If such a big problem can be fixed by something as simple as moving the statue to a secure location, why wouldn't it be done? So many funds could be redirected to the community if the sheriff's office didn't have to protect it 24-7. It could be a win-win situation for everyone involved. The sooner we begin making plans to relocate the statue, the sooner our community can begin healing. The way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. Ida B. Wells. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cooper. The next person is uh, Meg Williams. Williams, um, we're not addressing individual commissioners tonight. So if you want to go ahead and begin your three minute public comment, that'd be fine. Sure. On June 20th, my husband and I received word that two of our Alamance County neighbors were suffering a barrage of insults and racial slurs simply for being black in downtown Graham and that they did not feel safe. 
So we came to stand with them. No chanting, no signs, none of this action you see outside, no in involvement with the instigators whatsoever, simply observing for their protection. And what we saw was abhorrent. Neo-Confederates were crowded in the street and on the sidewalks, boasting their support of a known racist, waving flags synonymous with the institution of slavery, sporting shirts, branding them members of Act Back, which, as you know, the Southern Poverty Law Center branded a hate cr group in 2017. They've barely, barely lost it, but it's coming back. They've opened up their violence. We all know it's coming. Hurling insults at us simply for being there openly carrying weapons, which not only does not feel peaceful when the owners of those weapons are referring to you as target practice, but it's illegal in demonstrations at North, in North Carolina. None of them were arrested for this, nor and had an attempt even been made to disperse this crowd for hours, unlike the multiple quick attempts at dispersing and preventing po peaceful police brutality protests. We witnessed three assaults that night. Your collective position on the Confederate monument that this crowd was gathered to protect and glorified has continued to be, it's fine. I'm here to tell you that it's not. Your constituents are telling you that it's not. We're telling you with our emails. We're telling you with our unanswered phone calls. We are telling you with our peaceful, weapon-free presence here tonight. We are telling you with our 700 marchers strong that it is not fine. Things are not fine in Alamance County. It is not fine for our neighbors to threaten to go hunting with peaceful human activists as their prey. It is not fine for an active hate group to claim to speak for the majority as they openly profess their, their willingness to go to war over even legal removal of a monument. It is not fine for our elected officials to continue to turn a blind eye as state emergency after state of emergency suppresses our right to protest and loses our business what little revenue they could be bringing in during the economic crisis of a global pandemic. It is not fine to continue to force our black neighbors to walk under the watchful eye of a symbol of their oppression erected by mem founding members of the KKK in Alamance County by the murderers of Wyatt Outlaw as a symbol, a celebration of white blood and white blood only, and to remind them of their place in the legal system. It is not fine to have elected officials who stoop to accusing other county leaders of ambushing them with a public call to action when they have continued to refuse to act. It is not fine that when we reach out directly instead of publicly, we get ignored, we get hung up on, we get told that we hate America. It is not fine, and we cannot afford to wait for your replacements in November. We need you to step up and do your jobs now because nothing in Alamance County is fine. Thank you. All right, the next on the list is uh, Dremel Caldwell. What was that, uh, that lady's name? Meg, Meg Williams? Yeah, Meg Williams. You got her email. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dreamer Caldwell. My address is 314 Field Street in Graham. Welcome. Welcome. I am here to ask for your leadership as county leaders and to ask for effective communication. I've spent the last several months throughout different community events, and I've failed to see you all. And I understand due to COVID that you may have had reservations. But as a board, you failed to make a statement on what's going on in our community. And so that leads us to believe that you just don't care. I have seen the email responses that you've given our citizens. And so I failed to email because I felt there was no point. If we are not allowed to protest, if we're not allowed to email, if we get hung up on when we call, what is appropriate? I have asked that you all Take the time to listen to the residents and see how they feel. I know that as elected officials that you spend lots of times in training and there's been education to learn more about your roles. However, there is no training to become an active listener. Not just an active listener, but one that listens with your heart and that is an emphatic listener and one that has experiences uh, listening to the experiences of people. Many residents uh, have sent their emails trying to explain that to you, how they felt. An opportunity to create a dialogue that was lost. I implore you to please provide opportunities to meet with community members and leaders. Technology now allows for virtual town halls, survey monkeys, and I implore you to listen 
not to defend a position, to listen. I challenge you to use citizen input to make changes that will make a better Alamance County fair and equitable to all of us. Even when you disagree, please emphatic listen and that lets people know that at least you care about their position. When I first met the Burlington Police Chief, it was in a community meeting and he came to the people. The people did not come to him. Historically, many find that this area in Graham is not an area that we feel safe in. There's a lot of tensions for people that are black and brown coming to Graham. And when we enter into county buildings and we fail to see a representation of ourselves, we're not comfortable being here. If any of you all did not want to have uh, this type of input with citizens, then why become a public servant? The public put you here and the public can take you out from here. We have a chance to hear from the county commissioners a statement that you all stand on the fact that you won't allow a county that is not fair and equitable, that you are listening to the people. No matter what the differences are here in Alamance County, we all want the same things. We want a better Alamance County. So I implore you all to do your part and listen to what the residents want. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Then, <clears throat> The next on the list is Quinn Ray. Good evening, board. I appreciate you. My name is Quinn Ray. I'm a resident of Elon, um, and I'm a business owner here in town. I was coming to speak to you and encourage you um, in good faith to enjoy and uh, join the conversation about the Confederate monument. The time has come for the board to set its most energetic and expedient resolve towards this righteous end of removing the monument, an unequivocal symbol of oppression constructed to the advancement of a racist narrative from its current public location. I'm sorry you're upset with this, Mr. Sutton. What did I do, sir? You rolled your eyes at me, sir. No, I didn't either. <laughs> I'll get out of it. Go on. Keep talking. Go ahead. Beats all I ever seen. I swear to God it did. Nothing good of the people of this community can come from an eruption of violence, whether at the hands of civilians or law enforcement. Such violence would affirm nothing but the worst of this county and would certainly do nothing to recommend Alamance County to the world. Alamance County should be a beacon, not a blight. Never has it been more true in the midst of a global pandemic and an economic downturn. Choosing violence over reconcil reconciliation and property over people just jeopardizes the community's ability to invite new partnerships and opportunity for growth. It also endangers the current friendships that we are looking for. Even more dangerous is how our wounds of our choices may inflict upon the souls of our community. This is especially true if we choose violence in the service of protecting property. What would it say about Alamance County if we were choosing to protect the integrity of property over the integrity of people? This property some would choose to defend with violence against other humans, either actively in the hate-filled name of heritage and history, or passively in the lazy service of civil tree, reason, and order. That is not a choice made by serious people who face serious problems, nor is it a choice that any but those most poignantly privileged by the color of their skin are ever offered. Commissioners, you must choose. The time for simplistic law and order and binaries are easy. Laissez-faire buck passing has long passed. We must decide. One path is to advocate your leadership, and the path leads into two outcomes, either deadly force or disgrace. The other path involves setting aside lazy us versus them. This requires responsibility for the well-being, not only of the people you serve, but the very soul of the county which has given you its trust. And yes, this is far more demanding of a choice. It insists that you have the fortitude to choose people over property, the strength to affirm that growing pains of progress are tough. But we need to understand that we have to have the empathy to recognize that no history, real or imagined, is worth delivering a message of racist oppression to yet another generation in this county's beautiful children of every race, color, and creed. We have the power to relocate it. You have the power to relocate it. This is now an issue of public safety. You know this is an issue of public safety because we have armed protection. We have the city of Graham declaring a state of emergency in the name of public safety. We have permits to protest that were attempted to be suppressed in the name of public safety. Not to mention the plethora of comments on social media indicating violence for the monument. I urge you to choose. 
Thank you for your time. Excuse me, where did you say you were from? I'm from Elon. Oh, you're from Elon. Yes, sir. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next uh, public speaker is Katie Cassette. Katie? Katie? Carrie. Carrie Griffin. Carrie Griffin? No, Katie Cassette is the next person. They're here. They're not here. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Carrie Griffin. On June 4th, I stood with another grand business owner on the sidewalk in Court Square in solidarity and in protest. Why? Because only weeks prior, a police officer held his knee on George Floyd's neck for 8 minutes and 46 seconds, resulting in yet another murder of an unarmed black man by police. The obvious disregard for life, black life, was apparent that day, and here in Alamance County, it is equally apparent. That, that day, we came to walk the sidewalk of Court Square in protest, our constitutional right. We were immediately told to disperse by a grand police officer who cited an unconstitutional, now repealed ordinance. We left that day, but returned the following, a hundred strong, abiding by city rules to keep moving, stay on the sidewalk, and only tour Graham. We were still, still not allowed to protest. Fifteen days later, neo-Confederates gathered in Court Square, many armed, and were not made to disperse for hours, even after they assaulted two people. Commissioners, do you not consider this a double standard? In the last four weeks, I have lost count of the number of threats of violence, intimidation, and call to arms neo-Confederates have directed at peaceful protesters. ACBAC, once identified as a hate group, continues to occupy Graham in an effort to preserve their southern heritage and their monument. A monument that currently stands at the steps of the courthouse and the county seat. A monument that clearly does not belong to the people nor represent the future, the increasingly diverse population of Alamance County desires. A monument that, though ownership is still in question, has been defended and protected by both the city of Graham and the county. We continue to show up peacefully while white supremacists have assaulted others and posted their threats on social media against this movement. And this has become a public safety issue. Relocation is the only answer for the Confederate monument. The sheriff, the commissioners, and the city of Graham's protection of the monument is just another example of the intolerance and history of intimidation present in this county. I recognize the monument is just one symptom of the deep-rooted racism in Alamance County. Until the statue is moved, we as a community cannot begin to repair the bigger issues. That black and brown lives are disproportionately policed, killed, and jailed over their white counterparts. And yes, right here in Alamance County. This is exactly why we have to do something. Just this week, the public finally got answers regarding Jaquan Light's murder. He was not simply killed by a discharged weapon. He was killed by a police officer who was currently sitting behind a desk on administrative leave paid for by the taxpayers. The county owns the courthouse. It's the county's responsibility to maintain and regulate this property. And as county commissioners, I urge you to make a statement against Alamance County's hateful heritage. I urge you to move this monument to a location more suited to its purpose, to a cemetery alongside the fallen soldiers it honors. Thank you. Ms. Griffin, may I ask you a question before you go? Yes, ma'am. I have uh, the next speaker signed up is Carrie Kirk Griffin. That's the same person. It's a uh, mistake. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. The next person is uh, Michael Graves, who asked to be called. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Can it, hey guys, can you tell, uh, there is one more person on the list, yeah. Mr. Graves? Yes. Can you hear us? I can. Okay, you're connected to the county commissioner's meeting. Hi, Mr. Okay, Graves. Uh, Hi, Mr. Graves. This I, is Amy uh, Gailey. How hey, are you? Uh, good morning. I mean, uh, good day, commissioners and uh, county manager. Um, I don't have a speech. I'm going to just speak from my heart and my head. Uh, first of all, I want to point out that I was part of the uh, DA's um, re uh, prior to the press conference. Mr. Light was not shot in the back. Uh, the autopsy report was there for us to view, so he was not shot in the back. And I think that's part of the problem. There's a lot of misinformation. I spent most of my day working with um, inmates at the Alamance County Jail, aided by the sheriff and um, some of his top administration. Uh, the people that are speaking, I did not see there um, to help any of those individuals there. This term racism that we're throwing around doesn't apply to everybody in every situation. Now, I do agree with most of the things that were said to the commissioners about the uh, statue. You all know I've sent you a uh, video trying to work to get the statue down. I do not believe that uh, you can tear down a piece of property uh, and call it progress. I believe you work within the law. Uh, to get that statue down. When I called for that statue to be down 15 years ago, again, I did not see any of these people. Um, but I'm glad they're here now. But I would say to the commissioners, we do have the problem. We do have chaos. Uh, that statue was dedicated by the head of the KKK. So don't talk to me about heritage. If it was just about heritage, you would not need the head of the KKK to do uh, to, uh to dedicate that statue. And what I've asked the commissioners is if we can respectfully remove the statue to a Civil War museum so anybody that can want to pay homage to that can come there and, and pay homage to that. Not only that statue, which there's another statue in the state of North Carolina just like that, but it's to a Union soldier. So, you know, let's just stop with the symbolism stuff. But I would say to, to the commissioners if we could uh, uh, take the statue down, form a Civil War Museum. Families of uh, people in Alamance County that had members of their families can come there and pay homage on the North and the South. And then, you know, any reasonable person, that would be acceptable to any reasonable person. But I was told that I had to work with the Daughters of the Confederacy, which I did call, and had a very good conversation with the lady. Some people can't say publicly what they say privately. But then I was told I had to work with ATBAC, which is a known hate group who believes that I'm a second-class citizen. That was insulting to me, and I will not do that. I was told we need to sit down and work with people and ask the correct people to get the statue down. You know who that is? That's Commissioner Lashley, Commissioner Gailey, Commissioner Carter, Commissioner Boswell, and Commissioner Sutton. Mr. Graves, Those are the people who hey, Mr. Graves, I'm sorry, um, and so, Mr. Graves, your three minutes is up. Do you have like a concluding sentence or finishing up I, thought? I will, yes, I will. I will say this: until that statue is taken down, we are putting the lives of our law enforcement. We are depleting the coffers of our county. And I just want y'all to think about this: when those law enforcement officers come out there and engage with with the protesters to protect a piece of cement. They could get the COVID virus. And then who will you have to protect the living? We are putting our officers' lives at risk. And I think we just need to do the right thing and lead. Lead by example and do the right thing and protect our county and protect our citizens. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Grace. Um, uh, the public comment period started at 8.53. It is now 9.23. So it has been 30 minutes, and so the public comment period has concluded. Do we have any commissioner responses? Since there are no commissioner responses, um, having been advised by the county attorney, 
not to make comments related to uh, pending litigation. Um, do we have a county manager's report? Uh, one, uh, one thing I would like to draw the commissioner's attention to in the financial report in the packet that you've received, uh, we're monitoring sales tax receipts. As you all know, we uh, were concerned about sales tax revenue for this fiscal year. Uh, we can say at this point that the fiscal year 1920, last fiscal year, uh, through 11 months of the fiscal year, we were up 2.2 percent higher than we were in 1819. That is good news. That's not as high as we normally are, but that's still still good news. Uh, for the month of March of 2020 versus March of 19, we were down 3.85 percent. Then for the month of April of uh, 20, April 2020 compared to April of 2019, we were down 6.94 percent. So uh, we saw a greater downturn in sales tax revenue for the month of April, but that was the major shutdown month uh, for the COVID uh, pandemic. So for the months of March and April combined for 2020 versus 2019, we're down 5.35 percent. I take this as good news for, for the economy in Alamance County and for our projected sales tax revenue. Commissioners, if you'll recall, we estimated 20% uh, downturn in sales tax. Uh, my hope is that is not accurate, that we're actually going to receive greater sales tax revenue than what I projected. So we'll continue to monitor this, but I wanted to be sure to bring that to your attention. And, you know, we've talked about later on in the fiscal year, if that trend continues and we're not experiencing 20% downturn, maybe revisiting some of the cuts that we have made, uh, but we'll, we'll keep you posted as we go. So. Brian, I got a question. It's not really about sales tax, but it's to the point of these companies that we've done incentives with over the past years. How how are we monitoring that? You know, if they're shut down, of course they wouldn't have any employees. How is that? So they have to before they're able to receive their payments, they have to demonstrate to the to the <laughs> county that they have paid their taxes, and they have to demonstrate that they've hired the folks that uh, that they said that they would hire. The contracts that we've been doing for the past couple of years all have pro rata uh, built into them. So if they don't hit their actual target, they said they were going to invest 50 million, they only invest 45, we reduce the amount of incentive. So I think we have seen pretty good success over the past couple of years uh, with return. Well, even with the COVID, I would think we're being successful because a lot of our new businesses, essential business. So yes. That's and and I, I do think too that this, this sales tax downturn of almost seven percent for the month of april when we were in the throes of almost total shutdown uh is is pretty is a sign of our strong economy in alamance county so we've seen our incentivized businesses have done very well and are uh hiring folks and continuing to work so. yeah. and that's all awesome. <laughs> oh, what's this what we're supposed to do yep all right does anybody have any commissioner comments tonight Okay, if not, Mr. Boswell, would you mind making that motion? Yeah, let me put my glasses back on if I can keep them unfogged on that. I would like to move that we now go into closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute Section 143-318-11A3 in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the county attorney and the board and receive a report regarding the claims made in the case entitled NAACP et al. versus Graham et al. So moved. Got a second? Second. Yeah. Okay, uh, so we have a motion and a second to enter closed session. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 for watching the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Meetings of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners occur on the first and third Monday of every month in the Commissioners Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. Typically the first meeting of the month occurs at 9 a.m. and the second meeting occurs at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. 
The video of this meeting is broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about this schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our website at www.alamance-nc.com or at our YouTube channel. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of the meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about our commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on Local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.